I appreciate it. Uh, how is it uh, in L.A.? Oh, LA is good. You, I have to tell you, your videos are incredible. I went down a rabbit hole of like watching as many as I could. One of the more recent ones, the uh, the water weasels. My God, they are vicious. Oh yeah, that that's oh, that's always a fun one because uh, yeah, I, I I love freaking people out. It's like that's the <laughs> easiest way because everyone thinks of them as like really cute and adorable, and then I pop in like actually, yeah, <laughs> that, that's rabbits. always that's always fun. Oh yeah, definitely. I've had a healthy fear of them for the longest and now everyone's catching on. So I know I wasn't crazy. I'm, I'm very afraid of them as well because of your video. So thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Could you like briefly explain just what was it you were like struggling with that led you to just being on that bridge that day in 2000? Like what were you like going through that like just made you feel like you couldn't really, like that was your last option basically? You know, Mama Do, I got into this, this kind of space of pure brain health instability where I believed I had no other course of action but to take my life. And I always tell people I didn't want to die. I believed I had to. And those are mm. two categorically different things. And I got to a place in such desperate pain that I thought that was my only option. I was in lethal emotional pain. The pain was immense. The pain was immeasurable. It was inescapable. And I was hearing voices in my head, auditory hallucinations telling me I had to die. And at the moment before I leapt off the rail, the voice screamed, jump now. And I did. Definitely uh, can't even imagine how that kind of thing feels. But um, obviously I've read about your story and I've gotten, I got curious and I read about other people, other survivors, and a lot of, there's always seems to be the common denominator where it was whatever struggles they had in their life, whatever drove them to that point, the moment like they left the ledge and they couldn't take it back. That's when all of a sudden, whatever brought them there didn't matter as much right when they thought that their life was over. That's when they suddenly realized what you said, they didn't really want to die. They felt like they had to. So when the earth is no longer under your feet and you're like just free falling towards what you believe is pretty much the end, can you uh, explain just like what's going through your mind when that happens? Like that moment, like you just made that decision. You know what I'm going to do? It wasn't like a cognitive decision. Like you decide to have a piece of pizza or you decide to go to this or that school. It was, it was more like I was compelled to take my life. And following those 220 feet, 25 stories at nearly 80 miles an hour in four seconds, I, the only thoughts running through my mind were, what have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. And like you said, all the other survivors, we all had one thing in common, instant regret. The moment our hands left the rail, we regretted we would did what we did and we obviously thought it was too late. None of us had ever heard of people surviving a jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. We didn't think it was possible. That's why we went there to do what we did. And the idea that I would open my eyes 70 feet beneath the water, realize I was alive and now be drowning and not want to drown and be like, why'd you jump into a giant body of water? You know, this irrational, illogical thought process led to suicidal crisis, not rational, logical thought process. That's very insightful. Thank you. So um, basically now at this point, you, you've hit the water. You've obviously survived, thankfully, but you're in excruciating pain. You're struggling to keep your head above water. And you see this like dark, shadowy figure just approaching you from underwater. You, at the time, you don't know what it is. What are you thinking when that thing's approaching you? Are you thinking you're about to be attacked? Are you like, oh shit, like this really might be it? Like what, what are you, what's going through your mind there? I thought it was a shark and I mm. thought it was coming for me. I thought this is it. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to devour me. Uh, I was terrified and it kept circling beneath me faster and faster, but it wasn't biting me and I got confused. I was like, what, what is this thing? And so I, in, in, in fear that it was a shark, I began to punch it with my only good hand and I'm punching this thing, but it's not going away. It's now circling faster and faster, faster and faster. And at the time it came to me, Mama Do, I had gone down in the water and I couldn't get back to the surface. So I thought, mm. I, I thought, I thought that when this thing came to me, I thought I'm going to die and no one's going to know that I don't want to. No one's going to know I knew I made a mistake. And that's when the creature starts bumping me up like this. And it puts me to the surface and no longer am I wading in the water or treading in the water. I'm lying atop it on my back, being kept buoyant by the creature. Thinking to myself, this is one hell of a nice shark. <laughs> so at this point, you're like full into like fight or flight mode, right? So like, when does it like, does it ever like hit you in that moment that, you know, this thing might have just saved my life? Or are you just thinking, wow, I kind of got away with one. Like, did you realize what happened? Were you like fully cognizant of like the whole experience? I was fully aware and, and the depression was kind of like wiped clean from my, my mind. But I still thought, because I had, I had no knowledge that sea lions were in that area. 
I thought it was a shark the whole time. And I'm thinking that this is just, you know, a shark that's not going to bite me, I suppose. But, you know, uh, you know, it's a great white breeding ground. So it, it would have been possible. A lot of people who go off the Golden Gate Bridge are eaten by fish and sharks to the bone. So when they don't, when they find their bodies and they find them dismembered, they don't count that person as a jumper, even if they find their note on the top of the bridge or at the rockway or in a car somewhere, they don't count that person because they didn't find the whole body. It's, it's, it's terrible. But oh, I, I just fully believe that this was a really kind hearted shark. Yeah. I think I might've read something where you didn't find out till like a couple of days later. And it was people that were above the bridge looking down at you that they noticed the sea lion and that it was circling you and keeping you afloat. When did you like realize that it actually was a sea lion and not just a really like, I guess, happy go lucky <laughs> shark? <laughs> well, it wasn't actually until a year later, I was on a television program promoting a suicide prevention campaign and the show went viral online and people wrote into the show from all over the world, like Italy, China, Ireland, Japan. And one man's letter sticks out above all the rest. He was named Morgan. He was from Las Vegas, Nevada. And the guy was on the bridge that day with his mom. And he writes to ABC News and he says, Kevin, I'm so very glad you're alive. I was standing less than two feet away from you when you jumped. Until this day, watching this show, nobody would tell me whether you lived or died. It's haunted me until right now. By the way, there was no shark, like you mentioned, you thought there was on the show, but there absolutely was a sea lion and the people above looking down believed it to be keeping your body afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind you. What does a message like that do to you? Like when you like read that for the first time? Well, it blew me away. It blew me away and, uh, and he sent a picture because he, he had a digital camera that day, took pictures of it. And it was very morbid. It was my lifeless looking body on top of the water with this creature keeping, you know, as the pictures went forward, you could see it just circling beneath me. Um, so it was crystal clear. But uh, I'll tell you, my dad, to his credit, called me a year to the date of my attempt. So a year after, right? At the same time, my attempt, he goes, Kev, we're going for a drive. And I go, where are we going, Daddy? So like I said, for a drive. So we go out and we go, we're going down Park Presidio. We're going down 19th Avenue and it's going to the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm like, Dad, I don't want to do this. I, I can't do this. He goes, Kevin, we need to do this. We need closure. And he pulls over and he has me pick a flower out of a flower bed. It's like a purple tulip and everything. So we go out and we go uh, to the Golden Gate and we're in the car and I'm nauseous already. I'm like, Dad, I can't get out of the car. He's like, Kevin, mm -hmm. we're doing this. I need closure. I was like, okay, dad. All right, fine. So we go out there and we, he goes, show me the exact light rail. And I knew exactly where it was that I jumped. So I walked to the light rail. I'm having vertigo. I'm getting dizzy. I'm, I just really feel sick. My dad grabs my hand and we say a couple of prayers and he says, drop the flower. And I go like this and I drop the flower over the rail and it kind of wafts down real slow and it hits the water, makes the tiniest of ripple effects. Hence the name of our film's two side ripple effect. And two feet to the right pops up a sea line. And it huh. was it was arguably the most beautiful moment I've ever spent with my father next to him being the best man at my wedding. It was incredible. It was like, it was like everything came full circle. And, and in that moment, my dad was absolutely correct. I had closure and people always ask me, how do you go back to the bridge and do work there? And I say, because I have closure, I've had it for all these years. I can look at that bridge and I can see it's a beautiful art deco masterpiece. That's not safe. Well, we're making it safe right now. We have fought for 20 years to, building that on the bridge it's being built right now and as of november of 2023 not one more person will ever again die off the golden gate bridge that's amazing i oh i almost stupidly want to ask did he have any way of knowing a sea line would pop up right there because that's almost like <laughs> almost too cathartic you know just to have the only thing that'd be better if we knew for sure if it was the same sea line you said this was a year <laughs> after right uh, well, it was a year after yeah but you know i, I when i was in the water it, it's this odd thing i when the creature was keeping me afloat, it wasn't biting me. I had this passing thought in my head as I was waiting for someone to rescue me. I was like, you know, if someone was going to rescue me, obviously the Coast Guard did come. But in that moment before the Coast Guard got there, I was like, I'm going to call this guy Herbert. And I, I just, and I've kept that, I've kept that since then. His name's Herbert, whatever, whatever Herbert. he, Herbert is the name. And, and it saved my life. When I, when I travel and, and, and tell my story, I, I always say, are there any Herberts in the room? And I tell you this. I would do. No one ever raises their hand. And I, and all the, I swear, all the Herberts are gone. Like there's, there's not a Herbert left. <laughs> it don't exist. It's an old school name. That's amazing. I never even heard that story with you and your father. I'm so glad you shared that with me. Um, so that was uh, 22 years ago, almost 22 years to the date. Actually, it was on a September, if I'm getting that right. 
Uh, yeah. Since then, you've obviously been a huge mental health advocate. You're a best-selling author. You have a documentary, an award-winning documentary film based on you. But And I'm also glad you mentioned the bridge because you are also one of the biggest advocates for the safety bridge that's constructed, that's going to be constructed under the Golden Gate Bridge. I believe they're going to finish construction uh, sometime next year, obviously, to make sure no one ever, you know, loses their life to that bridge. None of that ever happens if 19-year-old Kevin Hines never makes it out of the bay that day. So. If there, if you could say something to, you know, at the age of 41 now, if you could speak to 19-year-old Kevin on the bus, prepared to end everything, and along with anyone who might also be in the same space mentally, because there's probably at least one person watching this, what would you say to him? Because we've all heard the same, like, um, talking points, but it hits so much more differently when it comes from somebody that actually, you know, survived their attempt, somebody that was in that place mentally. So what would you say to him and by extension them? To 19-year-old Kevin and to anybody going through this kind of immeasurable pain. Today is not tomorrow. Just because you might be in a world of pain and struggle today does not mean you don't get to have that beautiful tomorrow. But my friends, you have to be here to get there in the first place. And see, I, I have this perspective that has shifted since the day I jumped. I see life through a different lens. Every waking moment is a gift. Everything I get to do, every place I get to go, every person I get to meet Mamadou is a gift to me. And I look at life like that. I take nothing and no one for granted like I used to do all the time. Nothing and no one, even the people I don't like, have a purpose in my life. And I appreciate them. I hold gratitude inside my pain. And, and to my 19-year-old self, I would say, this is not the option. There are other options. You will get through this. You will find that hope, at that light at the end of the tunnel. And if you haven't found it yet, you just haven't walked far enough to reach it. That's amazing. Um, could you, again, for... Uh people that still might not understand, explain the difference between feeling a compulsion towards um, taking a cer certain action and then just wanting to die. Because I feel like that's a big difference that people that might not have been in that space might not really understand. Could you, you just explain that one more time? Yeah, you know, people always say about suicidal people that they want to die. And I, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe that. I know there are people that I've met that say they want to die. They want to take their life. They use that language. But the reality is, they feel so compelled to die, they feel like they have no other choice, no other option. And when you feel you have no other option, that becomes the drastic reality, right? This idea of suicide. And when other people around you, because uh, we, you know, you know how we see familial suicides where like you have one person, like an uncle who dies by suicide, and then years later, a nephew or a niece or a, or a, or a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter die by suicide. Um, it becomes an option when someone in the family does it, and then it's thought about more more often. And when you see suicides in high schools, for example, and we do tours in high schools all over the world, it's people in high school die by suicide, or high school students attempting on campus, it becomes a massive option for the rest of the community at that campus, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, folks that, that go there. And so I believe people get into a space in their heads where they're in so much immeasurable pain. And I'll just ask you this, Mamadou, what's the one thing you want to happen when you find yourself in excruciating physical pain? What do you want that pain to do? I want to go. Yep. That's physical pain. Brain pain is 300,000 times worse, but everybody around you invalidates your brain pain because they can't see it. So you feel alone, you feel siloed, and you feel that that's your only option. And so the idea is to help people who are doing well mentally, help people who are doing well with their brain health, look out for people in pain who, who are crying on benches or, or, or on buses like me uh, right before I jumped, or, or people who are their strong friends who seem fine, ask them the direct questions. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? Do you have the means? Because those three questions are proven to save lives. I'm so glad you made that point because I think a really big misconception regarding this is that, um, well, one is that uh, obviously somebody with asthma, you would never say, oh, it's all in your lungs. Somebody with an ulcer, you wouldn't say it's all in your stomach, but somehow an ailment, a malady of the brain, to see if some people will actually say, well, it's in your head. And that's the hardest thing to kind of solve, right? Because you can't, there are no crutches, there's no bandages, there's no like scar, like you can't see it. And some people think because you can't see it, it must not be there or it's not as like, you know, as much of an issue as something that's more like uh, that manifests itself more physically. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad you made that. I'm so, I'm so glad you made that connection. Cause like, honestly, like I like the things that I understand. And even that the whole, what you asked me about pain, that really just opened my eyes. So I'm glad you, I'm so glad you made that, um, made that point. 
So obviously you had a complete 180 in terms of like your lease on life. And my question now is, was that something that was instantaneous? Once you realized you basically got a second chance at life, was it that, okay, well now I can't like, I have to make the most out of this or was it more like, did it take a, like a little bit longer for that to like set in for you to like have this new change in perspective? So I will tell you this, when I was on the boat, when I was on the Coast Guard boat and they pulled me out of the water and they put me in a neck brace and they strapped me in front of the toe and they were asking me all kinds of questions. Uh, and when they told me, young man, we have pulled 26 dead bodies from these waters this year alone, this unit alone, but only one live one, you, gave me the greatest point of perspective I've ever received in my entire life. And it made it crystal clear in that moment, no matter the pain I would ever be in again, I would never attempt to take my life. It's not mine to take. And when I did that, I live, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I live with chronic thoughts of suicide. They, they plague me. They're a part of my life. They're not every day, but they're often enough. And every time I'm suicidal, instead of acting on that suicidal impulse, I turn to anyone willing to empathize with me. And I say four simple, but very effective words. I need help now. That's my shorthand with my family and friends and my doctors. And when I'm with someone I don't know, or I'm, when I'm flying by myself, or I'm traveling, or I'm doing, doing work, and, and I don't have my wife with me, or my family with me, or my friends with me, or my peers, or my doctors, I will turn to anyone and say that. And they'll be like, what do you mean? They'll be like, well, I'm, I'm having suicidal thoughts. I need to, to be in a safe place. I, I need your help. And I to be very honest, not everybody can handle that kind of pain. And, and it's, it's, it's a very blunt thing to say to someone you don't know. And they'll be like, whoa, buddy, I don't know what the hell to do with you. I, 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 I'm, and they bounce. But, yeah. but by the sheer probability in 22 years of chronic thoughts of suicide, of the number of people I've turned to in 22 years, two decades and some change, somebody has always been willing to get my back and help keep me safe in that moment. And the best thing that people have done for me is like, well, what do you need from me? They'll just ask. And I'll say, you know, honestly, I, if you got a minute, I just need you to sit with me. I need you to, to just listen for a minute. And like I said, not always the first, second, third, fourth, fifth person that does it, but someone's always been there for me in that situation because I am self-aware with my diagnosis. I'm self-aware with my suicidal ideations. So I always stay here. I'm going to be here tomorrow and every day after that until the day I die of natural causes. That's amazing. And uh, honestly, that is very difficult to do to just like have that kind of vulnerability and ask for help. People always say that's the first step and the most difficult. And some people just, they can't, they can't do it. They, some, some, I don't know if it's like instilled with them or they feel like it might make them weak or something. So for people that might not be struggling, but they're around somebody, a family member, a close friend, they don't know how to help them because they don't want to be helped. What can from the outside looking in, what can you do for them? Just to like be somebody to them. What, what can you advise for those people? One of the best things you can do is not try to be Johnny Fix It. You don't need to mm. fix the problem. You need to physically hold space for that person. Sit next to them. Put your arm over their shoulder and just simply say, I got your back. Tell me all your woes. I'm just going to listen. It's not about what we say. Often that goes in one ear and out the other. It's about what we do about sitting next to the person, holding space for them and saying, look, I get that you, you think you need to take your life. I get it. It's, it's actually a very normal thought. As, as people would like to make it look abnormal all around the world, it's not abnormal. Millions of people have these thoughts all around the world every year. Let's normalize the idea of suicide ideation and say, let's have the courage to be there for the person, say, I got your back and say, I accept your thought processes but let's stay here in this moment until it passes. This too shall pass, and I'm not letting you go because I'm telling you suicide is not the answer. It's the problem. I can't even imagine how many lives you've saved just by saying that and just by just by being like somebody to listen to or in your case, just somebody to look up to. So again, I do appreciate you sharing that with me. I was going to say that's, that's all the questions I had. That's not really true. So when I did the, obviously I did the video and, uh, I transitioned into it by using the sea lion because obviously I'm very like animal centric with my con with my uh, content. I did get one comment that was like, "Oh, and he never even thanked the sea lion." Wow, which I guess <laughs> either was sarcasm or I was like, I, I don't know how that was your takeaway. But you know, now that I have you here, uh, is there anything you'd like to say to Humphrey? You said Humphrey the sea lion. If Herbert, he's somehow Herbert. listening. <laughs> oh, Herbert, my bad. Herbert, Herbert the sea lion. <laughs> Herbert. Okay. Uh, there, if there's anything you can say to Herbert the sea lion, uh, what would it be? Well, first of all, when I went back with my dad and that sea lion popped up, I thanked the hell out of that guy. 
you know, I was just, I just imagined it being the same sea lion. So it was very symbolic. So I did thank him. And if I was going to say anything to Herbert, and if Herbert could understand my language, which obviously he must have because he came to my aid when nobody else would, right? So Herbert, I have to say this from the bottom of my heart, from my gut, thank you for saving my life. Thank you for keeping me afloat. You are incre- you're an incredible animal. Uh, you're a gift to this, this world. Um, and if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't have married the love of my life, my very best friend, Margaret. I wouldn't have two God babies that I love dearly, Zoe and Judah. Uh, and I wouldn't have had a dog named Max, who I love, and he was my support animal, my emotional support animal for 10 years before he passed. So I wouldn't have all these things if it wasn't for Herbert. So thank you very much. You heard it here. All because of Herbert. Um, <laughs> this isn't really a question. I just want, I thought it was interesting. I just wanted to bring it up to you. So there have been cases in like, nature where you see these altruistic uh, behaviors from animals, uh, behaviors that you look at it like that necessarily shouldn't benefit them. If anything, they might be putting themselves at risk, but they'll do it to like help out another animal. Usually you see that within their own species, but rarely you'll see altruistic behaviors where animals put themselves on the line to protect animals of different species. Uh, My favorite example would be the humpback whale. Uh, might be the only animals that stand up to orcas, killer whales, because they regularly, they hunt in pods. They're like the wolves of the sea. But there have been cases where these humpback whales see a sea lion or maybe a turtle or a stingray being hunted by a pod of orcas. And they'll take the seal or sea lion, put it like on its chest or belly and raise it above like the water where the orcas can't get to it. Or in some cases, they'll see the or- the orcas picking on uh, baby whales because they like to, you know, they'll pick off um, baby gray whales, chase them down, exhaust them. They'll do this thing called mobbing, where multiple humpback whales will just kind of confront the orca and they'll use their numbers to kind of just intimidate it and get it to be like, well, you know, maybe it's not even worth it. It'll go the other way. We don't really even know why they do this. Uh, the best explanation is that they have a strong, like, anti predator response because obviously they too will hunt humpback whales. So, like, when they hear the calls of hunting orcas, um, they believe that their first instinct is to look for any baby humpback whales, anything they may be going after, a possible target, and protect them. And if they can't find that, they'll find any small animal and just instinctively like protect it. But that's with humpback whales. In your case, it was a sea lion. So we have no idea why the sea lion, why Herbert did what he did. But um, man, it, like you like to think there's like this kindred spirits out there that ne- not necessarily are human. So um, yeah, that's just, uh, uh, you also see it with elephants too, but uh, you know, that's a part of like nature that we can't really account for. And I don't think we necessarily need to, I just think animals have as much of a capacity for empathy and compassion and altruism as humans. So um, again, not a question, but just something I wanted to share with you. I thought you might find interesting. So yeah. absolutely, absolutely interesting. And I'm sure you've seen all the like, YouTube videos with the top 10 animals that save humans' lives and things like that. Mm. And, you know, I'm often number three or two or one on those things. <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. But but um, I saw a story about a cheetah that saved a baby from another animal. I was like, like a child, an abandoned child, a cheetah saved an abandoned child. Uh, that was wild. And then I saw a story about a group of dolphins that saved a human or a couple of humans at, at a time from a, a, from a couple of sharks. Um, so, th- mm. so this has happened all over the world since the dawn of human history, and it's fascinating. And, and yes, they have the they have the exact em- uh, a level of empathy and care and compassion for other creatures, and it's it's fascinating to see that. Um, and they have that capacity, and it can't be denied. These are these are very intelligent creatures, and and they actually care. They do, they do, and I wish people would take more uh, interest into that side of nature, and not just. And obviously, yeah, I do talk about like the the really weird aspects of nature, the brutality, but I do like also talking about like, you know, I don't try to like Disney-fy nature. I don't try to romanticize it because then you have people, you know, trying to hug bears and, you know, you don't want that, but it's like uh, that side too, is just always like, you know, it's always fun to like touch on that. Yeah. The, the, the story you put up recently about the hippo uh, that, that had the, Mm. the, that his best friend uh, and then it wasn't so friendly after that. You know, that's a lesson. It's a lesson we learned by everybody who wants to befriend a hippo. You know, come on. It's, it's, that's, it's not a Yeah, idea. That's, that's exactly what I was talking about with romanticizing nature. There's that balance. There are people that are terrified of literally everything. They literally think Australia shouldn't even be like a place because of spiders and stuff like that. But then you have the other side where it's like, they think animals have a sense of like, I, I don't know what it, I don't know what the word is, intent, I guess. 
Animals don't judge you by intent. They judge you by, is, is it a predatory response? Is it prey? Can I eat it? Uh, or is it a possible threat? I might have babies around, something like that. So, yeah. you know, you try to like find that balance. Obviously, you're not going to domesticate a hippo no matter how much you think that thing loves you. It's like, it's still a wild, a very wild animal capable of like, well, we saw it. It killed him in the same river yeah. he rescued it from. So. Yeah, you know, and I'm sorry for that. Always, I mean, there's I'm sorry that. for the families lost. You know, I'm sorry that they lost their. It should have been obvious not to not to do that. You know, and, and um, I, I was at a restaurant in in Colorado once, and everybody was going bat crazy running outside, and I'm like, "What are you?" So I look out the window, mm -hmm. and there's a bear in a tree, and there's all of these tourists from all over the world. I mean, as close as they could get to him taking pictures. And I was like, I went to the back of the restaurant. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not having anything to do with this nonsense until it's over. But like, you can't do that. You can't go up to a bear and take pictures of it. It's going to maul you. Like, I, it blew my mind. Yeah. And the worst part is that bear is 100% dead if it does that. If it attacks in self-defense, as soon as a bear attacks a person, let alone kills one, it's kind of it for that bear. So, yeah. you yeah. know, you kind of wish people would, like, if you respected nature, like, as people... People are like, Australia is kind of like the joke where everything's, dead. if you just like mind your business and mind your space and you're not like, you know, trying to take a selfie with a kangaroo or something. And I've literally seen videos of that and the kangaroo just like drop kicks them. You will be fine. Like if you are just, it's just common knowledge and just being yeah. self-aware, but you know, there's that. And then there's people that don't want to deal with it at all. So, you know, you just try to find that balance. But um, yeah, I do really appreciate you talking with me. I think we have like six minutes left, but um. Obviously, you've had your hands in a lot of places since then. Uh, I listed, I listed uh, a lot of the stuff that you've done. You've been involved in a lot of foundations, projects. But now, um, what can we like? Ex what kind of? What can we uh, expect from you, like in the future? Like, what can we uh, look out for? Well, a couple of things. Please join me at the High Insights Podcast, H I N E S I G H T S Podcast. We interview people from all over the world, all walks of life, who have experienced extreme tragedy and trauma but overcome that trauma to find triumph over adversity and they've changed their lives. And now they're outgoing and changing the lives of others, which is incredible. So we're meeting people all over the world who are doing great work to, to give back to their communities all over, all over the place. And then in my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Kevin Hines, we have got 600 videos there that are designed to help you better your brain health. They are there for you. If you're struggling mentally, emotionally, physically, or otherwise, they're there for you to change your life. They're entertaining. They're educational. We've got some great YouTube celebrities on there that are doing some great work with us as well. And um, and then just find me at Kevin Hines Story on all social medias. Join the family. Join the team because we put out content every day that will absolutely, if you wanted to, change your life and help you do good. I believe there's far too much negative, hateful, spiteful, and hurtful media in the world. I think we, like like what you create is fantastic. Let's all together start to create positive content that can change lives and give back to people in pain. Well, there you go. Uh, he has a podcast. Make sure you listen to that YouTube channel. Like I said, best-selling author, award-winning documentary film. And it's all because of a sea lion named, not Humphrey, Herbert. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I can't even imagine how busy you are. So you being able to fit me in your schedule, I really appreciate that. My whole team does. And uh, like I said, before, before you ever reached out to me, you were like, a huge like inspiration i read about your story i don't remember how old i was when i first heard about it but um just being able to talk to you being you having like just taking the time to like talk to me and share your uh, experiences your thoughts it means more than i well maybe you understand but more than i like to think you like can uncomprehend so you know again thank you for my whole team we really appreciate it and uh yeah thank you mama do i really appreciate you and i hope you have a great day you too my man